Episcopal, and Brother Austin and I did not coordinate, so uh, you can't blame us of that. But it is amazing to see what God has done. This is not in my notes at all, but this morning I'm sitting there in Sunday school, and uh, Pastor Bleak goes to Matthew 16. I was going to go to Matthew 16 tonight as a piece of a little bit of a reference point in Jonah 1, so we're going to, I called an audible, and now we're going to go to Mark 8, but uh, we, he also talked about a few uh, pieces this morning that I was going to talk about in tonight's message, and he and I didn't coordinate our messages either as far as like what we're talking about, so it's just so great to see what the Lord has already done before I even get up here to start. None of y'all would have known that had I not told you. That's why I did, so that you can see how great our God is. You should know we should all be counting our blessings every day. Amen. Uh, so thank you for everyone who showed up. Uh, there's a few that told me they would be here and that are here. Um, so I really appreciate that. Such an encouragement to me. You can go ahead and turn to Jonah 1. I'll turn there in a minute with you. But this is going to be the uh, second sermon in the series as we go through the book of Jonah. As most of you know, I uh, thought I was leaving in July, so I didn't think I was going to get to finish Jonah with y'all, but uh, maybe I will now. We shall see. In the first uh, series or sermon of the series as we were going through Jonah, we talked about three pieces last time, and you know, if this was Sunday school, I would call on each of you and hope that you could answer the three, but since it's not, I will just give you those. Those were the book of Jonah, Jonah and Nineveh. So when we were covering the book of Jonah, we talked about how most of the books of the, that are prophets anyway consist of multiple sermons, whereas Jonah varies in that because it is more just a long story or a biblical account of Jonah's life. And then I put this quote out there, and I want to say it again because it will be pertinent to tonight's message as well. And again, I don't have the uh, author, but it is very applicable, so I will read it in says, the story of the prophet Jonah reveals a God of mercy who is always willing to respond to repentance with forgiveness and compassion. Is that not a great message about the Lord? We all need a God that can respond to our repentance. Then we talked about Jonah. Jonah's the son of Amittai. That's stated both in Jonah and in 2 Kings verse number, or chapter 14, verse 25. It also says that he's a prophet. Uh, Jonah was uh, to travel to a foreign land. We saw that he did not travel immediately to that foreign land. Jonah means dove, which symbolizes peace. And we talked about how at the end of Jonah, you can go ahead and read ahead. This is open book. Um, And you will see that at the end, Jonah is a dove. And then we talked about Nineveh. What a great city that Nineveh was in size. How very wicked the city was. We compared it to many of our larger cities in the nation today and the wickedness we see going on today. But Nineveh is around 220 miles northwest of Baghdad, and we talked about how ISIS was there only a few years ago and the wicked that they were doing that very much seemed similar to what the Ninevites of the time were doing. And then we talked about the picture of Christ that Jonah is and how it's mentioned in the Gospels. So now we're going to shift to just looking at kind of an overview. Um, And last time we only covered three verses, so we're going to attempt to cover the last bit of chapter one. So I know that's 14 verses, but I'm not a pastor yet, so that means that we probably should be able to get through it unless I chase some rabbit as well. Um, But we all know that that's uh, very true uh, when we get up here. But there's just so much truth and good that we can get from Scripture So it's easy to see. When you think about the book of Jonah, most people know it as just, oh, Jonah was in a fish for three days, three nights. God sent him. And that's kind of the the depth that, at least as children, we go. But you can turn to any piece of scripture, all of the stories you learned as a kid or hopefully learned as a kid, and there's just so much depth and richness and true to this day that can be applicable to our lives. So if you will, you should be with me now in Jonah 1. We're actually going to read through the whole first chapter, and then we'll jump into tonight's message after I pray. So in Jonah 1, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, 
and you'll see that come in mind in a minute. Go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We talked about Tarshish last time, too, if you'll remember. And it was basically the exact opposite direction of which Jonah was supposed to go. It's in what we would uh, see as modern-day Spain. So it was a far travel for Jonah to, get a, to go down to Joppa, but then head in the direct, uh, opposite direction of what the Lord had said to go to. Now in verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. Look at the capitalization there or how it's not capitalized. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. So if you see here, the mariners were praying to their gods. It's not capitalized, but in verse 6, uh, we're, talking, we're talking now to or the shipmaster, the captain's talking to Jonah. And so Jonah's God is our God, the only true God. It's capitalized. Moving into verse 7, And they said, Everyone to his fellow come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may come unto us? For the sea is wrought, and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. The sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I know that you know that I've studied for this message, Lord. Lord, you've given me so much to bring, Lord. You've uncovered so many truths to me, Lord, through this passage. Lord, I pray, Lord, that I just have the right words, Lord, to bring the message. Lord, if it's convicting to some, Lord, then let it be convicting, Lord. Lord, hopefully it's an encouragement to some as well. Lord, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to come here to serve and worship you, Lord. Lord, again, I pray for this uh, family, Lord, of believers that are gathered here. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, Lord, I pray that they just get that settled before they leave here. Lord, I just thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look here in verse 4, God sends a storm. Now we usually think of God as the one who calms the storm for us. But God is the creator of everything, so he can obviously send a storm if he wants to send a storm. If you remember to this morning again, in Jeremiah 9, uh, verse 24, it says, the Lord which exercised loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. So not only can God calm storms, but he obviously can send storms for judgment as well. 
And if you look here, I can only imagine what is going through the minds of the mariners already. The Bible says, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. So it doesn't say specifically, and I'm not adding to, but can you just put yourself there on the ship and just imagine out of nowhere, right, Jonah gets on and then just the sea is just troubled beyond anything they've ever seen because it says that the ship was like to be broken. So imagine yourself on the boat, and it's probably a ship, a larger ship, and then it just starts rocking like you've never seen, a storm that you've never seen. And then it says that the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. So I find this very interesting. People always try to fix things themselves without turning to the true God. I'm putting it that way because it says they turn to their gods. And then it's interesting, too, that you they're clearly pagans worshiping um, not God and their idols that they would call gods. But sinners always turn to prayer first. And who are they praying to? It does no good if you're not praying to the one and only God. But that's who the mariners are praying to. And then you continue on and it says, But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So there's these grown men seemingly on the ship, right? And there's a storm like they had never seen before. And here's Jonah, a prophet of God, running from God, not following God's will, and he's asleep. He's asleep. I just can't even imagine it. I mean, it is humorous, Brother Bill. I'm glad you laughed because I found some humor in it. I'm sitting there thinking, like, it storms outside in Texas some nights, and I can't sleep through that. How is Jonah sleeping in the bottom of the ship as everyone else is so afraid? But here is where we start to see a picture of Jesus. If you'll turn with me to Mark 4. We're going to read a little bit in Mark 4. Hold your place in Jonah. We're coming back. So Mark 4, verse number 35. And most of you will be familiar with this. Mark 4, verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He arose and rebuked the wind, said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So you see here that Jesus also was in a ship asleep. Now I'm not saying that Jonah is Jesus by any stretch, but you can start to see the picture of Jesus and you will start to be able to draw some comparisons in the two accounts here. As we go through. So the disciples and the mariners in both of the two stories were afraid. This shows how both followers of Christ and non believers will seek help when they're afraid. If you notice, God in verse 6 is capitalized, but not in verse 5, and I drew attention to that because that's very important, especially as we continue along throughout the scriptures. Next is the casting of lots. So Can you at least raise hands if you know what casting of lots is? When I first started studying the Bible, I I didn't know what casting of lots was. It seems very much like drawing straws or something of that nature. So for those of you that didn't raise your hand, I mean, if you have a rock with your initial on it, and then I have a rock with my initial on it, maybe we got to do two because we all got J anyway. We put it in an earthen vessel, we shake it around, and it falls on whose initials, whichever... um, lot or rock or whatever it is falls out, right? Um, Well, Jonah, he knows that he's running from God. So I think he would have been more surprised had the lot not actually landed on him. But we all knew 
from knowing what we know of Jonah running from the Lord, that the lot was going to land on Jonah. Um, so this is no coincidence. And if you look at the casting of lots, the last time you see casting of lots is in Acts 1, right before the day of Pentecost. And uh, Pastor talked about it this morning and last week, how believers automatically receive the Holy Spirit at salvation now, which happened after the day of Pentecost, which is why we don't have to cast lots now. We don't need lots to determine. We just need to go to God and listen to the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. So this lot divinely falls on Jonah. In verse 8 through 10, the mariners question Jonah, and he confesses. In 8, they say, it says, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? So he continues, and it says, And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and dry land. So here's Jonah running from the Lord, but yet he's still professing his faith to the Lord. And before we judge Jonah for running from the Lord, we've all been there, right? Uh, We've all been backslidden at some point. If not, it's coming at some point. Um, I hope that it doesn't. I wish I could stand up here and say that I didn't, but we all do. But at least he's still professing his faith in the one and only God, the God of heaven, which made the sea and dry land. This is where it gets interesting and it turns. It says, Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So why are the men exceedingly afraid? It says right there, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. Because he had told them. So you see in 9, it says that he is a Hebrew and that he fears the Lord, the God of heaven. So we don't see everything that is said because then it clearly says that he told them that he fled from the presence of the Lord. But now the mariners are starting to have a fear of the Lord. It says they're exceedingly afraid and it tells them why they're exceedingly afraid. And if you know in Proverbs 9.10, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So a proper fear of God is what's needed to come to know Christ as your Savior. pastor's been up here and he's explained it very well um, in the sense of, if you think of a a fear, it's not like you're shaking and trembling. I have a dog that shakes and trembles every time it storms. It's not like that. But if you put your hand on a stove, you know that it's going to burn you. And so you have a fear of that stove. Um, God controls everything. You should have the proper fear um, for the Lord. And again, Proverbs 9.10 states it there. So it's very interesting because the mariners, although they had their own gods, they definitely knew who the God was. Everyone at this time had heard of the Exodus, you know, the parting of the Red Sea. And so they were very much aware. So think of that. They know who God is. So they have the knowledge there. Um, at this point, they were before verse 10, right? They're praying to their gods, their idols. But now they see that this storm that came out of nowhere that could break the ship is now happening because his prophet is running from him. That's very interesting, and you you need to catch on to it because this is where the proper fear comes in. And so then they ask, what should we do? And so Jonah says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto them, that the sea may be calm unto us, for the sea rot and was tempestuous. Right? They're just like, What can we do to stop this storm? At this point, they clearly see that there's something a little bit supernatural. I hesitate to use that term because in our day and age, that could be taken out of context. But God had sent this storm, and now it's clear to the mariners. And he said unto them, verse 12, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be come unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. I want you to read that last piece there. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So Jonah tells the mariners to throw him into the sea. And this is where I say that Jonah comes to repentance. You say, well, how do I know that? He says, for I know that for my sake... 
When someone is, it's true repentance, they don't make excuses. They're literally turning their back on the sin that they have committed. If you remember the quote that I said a minute ago, the story of the prophet Jonah reveals a God of mercy who is always willing to respond to repentance with forgiveness and compassion. So if this wasn't true repentance from Jonah, then why would we need the great fish to come and swallow him up? Why would the Lord have sent the great fish to come swallow up Jonah for him to live three days and three nights? So Jonah came to repentance here, and he's willing to sacrifice for the mariners to save their life. It's, it's some commentators offer that he just wanted to die. But again, why would the Lord have sent a fish and still um, spit him up on dry land, right? Again, I said it's open book. We're going to get there, but... Um, why would any of that happen if it was just because Jonah wanted to die? I, I don't believe those commentators at all, and I think that this is clear um, in the Scripture that that isn't how it was. So if you look in 13, the mariners don't want to throw, throw Jonah over. right? They said they don't want the innocent blood on their hands, uh, so they rowed hard to bring it to the land. Now what sense does rowing hard in this storm make. I don't, I don't understand it because they've already threw over a lot of cargo. Um, they know that they're going nowhere. They know that it's because Jonah has disobeyed God, has not followed his will, but they're still going to row anyway. And before we get too hard on them, let's turn to Mark 8 and verse number 27. So hopefully you kept your place in Mark. I probably should have told you to do that. So in Mark 8, if you remember at this point, Jesus had already foretold his death once before at least, and then he tells them again here. So in Mark 8, 27, it says, And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and by the way he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders, and of the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So again, Peter here is clearly not wanting Jesus to have to die for him and doesn't want to let go of Jesus. Continue on in 34, it says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will sh save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Wow. So Jesus foretold his death on several occasions, his death, burial, and resurrections, but the disciples didn't want Jesus to die. This is a clear example there. Um, but can we blame them? I mean, would you, if you're walking with Messiah, the, would you really want to lose him? We, w we would have been there. So I'm just saying don't be so quick to judge Peter there. Um, and there's plenty of messages that could be preached on that whole uh, saying of get thee behind me, Satan. There's a lot there to... Uh, go study your Bible, and you can uncover it for yourself as well. Um, but the mariners here do not want to throw Jonah over. It's pretty clear. But look in verse 14. So it says, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, all caps Lord, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. They lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So this, I wrote in my notes, I put, wow. Wow. Look how far the mariners have come. 
So the mariners are praying to the God of heaven, again, the one and only true God at this point in verse 14. So then look what they do in verse 15. They throw Jonah over. The Bible says, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So if you remember, when Jesus was asleep, he told the sea to be still, the wind to be still, and it ceased, and then the disciples were exceedingly afraid. We saw the mariners be exceedingly afraid when they found out Jonah was um, fleeing from the Lord. Here they throw Jonah over, and Jonah was being used to bring others to Christ even when he was on the run from God's will. And the mariners, like I said, are praying to the God of heaven now. I don't know how that doesn't come with anything other than a wow. But in verse 16, it gets even, I would say, more impressive, if you will. But this is what we should expect of someone that just came to Christ. It says, the, um, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. So the mariners now follow in obedience unto the Lord and they offer a sacrifice unto him. Now the Bible does not specify what that sacrifice was. I think that we could draw a conclusion based off of their in a ship traveling to Tarshish that it was probably some sort of livestock that was on there that they were taking for the long journey there. Um, they had threw cargo over already. But either way, it was most likely not enough to express their gratitude. And so it says they made vows. And this wasn't being done because their earthly lives were spared, but rather it was because their eternal lives were now saved. So then in verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So last time we talked about uh, in the Gospels, and you could turn there, but how Jesus himself said he would be like, he says, Jonas, that he would be gone three days and three nights. So he's compared to Jonah. That's a lot of explanation and like a very long introduction, if you will, now to the application. And again, I told you that I'm not a Baptist pastor yet, uh, so I will get you out of here on time. But now it's time for the application. It's very simple application, though. The Bible says, actually, let's turn there. Let's go to Isaiah 57. Verse number 20. And y'all may beat me. My pages are sticking. So in Isaiah 57, 20, it says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, though is, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So the wicked here, the sinners, sinners, it's like a troubled sea. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You can't be more clear than that. As you can see, it's clear that sinner's life is a troubled sea. But as stated before, if you come to know Jesus, you can know the Jesus who calms seas. Again, we looked at the uh, Jeremiah 9 this morning. The Lord, which exercised loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. So if you are wicked, there is judgment to come. But you can know the love and kindness of the Lord, too, if you accept the Lord as your Savior. You just look at our text, for example, of how simple it is to put your faith in Jesus. The mariners, in verse 5, prayed to the heathen gods. In verse 10, they learned to fear the one true God, just from understanding that the trouble that they were seeing on their ship was due to the prophet fleeing God's will. And by the end of the story, they're crying out to him in prayer. So, again, I said it's a very simple application. And I want you to stand with me tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one's coming to you tonight. And, again, Pastor and I did not coordinate this. But I do have three questions I want to ask you. They're very similar to what you heard this morning. 
But first, if you're not saved, please raise your hand. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to come and pluck you out of the pew. I just want to pray for you. If it's you, just slip your hand up. I see your hands. You can put them down. Second, if you're saved but not living the way you should for Christ, maybe you're like Jonah, you're backslidden, you're out of God's will, you're not doing what you should be doing, then raise your hand. Again, I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to pray for you. I see your hands. You can put those down. Lastly, maybe you're saved. You're living the way that you should, but you just feel discouraged. I want to pray for you as well. Again, I'm not coming to you. I'm not going to pull you out of the pew. But if that's you, just lift your hands up, and I'll pray for you. This invitation time is not just for you. It's for me. It's for anyone in here. As the pianist begins to play, the altar's open. I saw your hands. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you just come if the Lord dealt with you. If there's something that you need to pray about, come here. If there's, you want to grab someone to pray with you, we'll pray with you. If you want to be shown how to know the Lord out of the Bible, know that you can go to heaven. The altar's open.